Hello. This is our first formal lecture. Part one, introduction. I intend to cut this lecture into two, lecture one and lecture two, so that each lecture will be approximately an hour. In this way, you do not have to watch a long video and stop and, and restart right in the middle. In this part, what we intend to do is provide you, providing you with some very interesting example. You could do it daily, and probably you have already done it. These are very general information. You could do it right after the class. So first, first thing first, this is a concurrent computing course. What is the meaning of the word concurrent? There are so many ways and so many uh, dictionary entries for concurrent. But in computer science, the word concurrent has a very specific meaning. Here, we try to define three terms interleaved, parallel, and uh, concurrent. So let's consider three processes, A, B, and uh, C. In the diagram, a red rectangle indicates that a process is executing. Of course, it has a CPU or a CPU core executing. The dash line indicates the process is suspended because it doesn't have a CPU. So look at this A, B, and C. A has the CPU and runs for a while and suspended due to whatever reason we will talk about in a future lecture. And Process A is suspended by the system. The system picks process B to run. B runs for a while and uh, suspended by the system. And then the system chooses C to run. C runs for a while and the system suspended and gets A to run again. So in this case, Let's assume that we only have one CPU. So A, B, and C come piece to get the CPU and use it. And if it fails to get the CPU for whatever reason, that process is suspended waiting for the CPU. In this way, we see A, B, C, A, B, C, and so on. But this is a not very, very realistic. When you look at this diagram, the size of each of the six box are essentially the same. In reality, the time for a process to get a CPU may be very, very significant. A may run for a long time and when B get a CPU, B runs a, for a very short time and gets suspended. So in this case, we know a process either is an A, B, or C. The, it stopped running and suspended, running, suspended until it finishes work. At any moment, at any moment, a process has some crop progress towards its finish but not all of them are running. In this case, we will refer to it as an interleaved execution. That is, if all processes are in progress, but not all of them are running, we call it interleaved. Here we use one CPU to run three programs A, B, and C. But if 
every process has its own CPU. So it could run from the very beginning to the very end on that CPU. In that case, if they are all running at the same time, we will say they, this execution is a parallel execution. So what's the difference between interleaved and the parallel? Interleaved usually means we have more processes. Don't worry about the meaning of process. You just consider it a program running. So if we do not have enough number of CPU to run a very large number of processes, the system, the system has to run all of this process in an interleaved way. For an example, in this case, we have only one CPU, but three processes then these three processes share the CPU. At any moment, only one of them could run. Now for the parallel case, we run three processes on three CPUs. Then everyone could run from the very beginning to very end without any problem. So, your program or multiple processes may not always run in an interleaved way or in a parallel way, even though we have enough number of CPUs. For an example, suppose in your system, there are five CPU or five CPU cores. And if you have six processes, it's very likely that these six processes may not run in parallel at all. Only five can have the CPU. But if you dig a little bit more into the details, each program or a process running would, will run for a while and uh, carries out some input output. We will talk about this uh, on the few slides later. Then, that process may not have the CPU. In that way, another process could take it, could take that CPU over. In that, therefore, processes running in a system could run interleaved for a while, or when the number of CPU is sufficiently large enough to run all the processes, then uh, all the processes, I mean, those processes are waiting for the CPU only, rather than waiting for something else. In that case, all processes could run in a parallel way. So in a system, the execution of processes sometimes could be interleaved, sometimes could be parallel. But if your system has more processes than the number of CPUs, then it's likely your processes would run in an interleaved way. So after understanding the meaning of interleaved and uh, parallel, Concurrent means, a concurrent execution means it is either interleaved or parallel. So in this sense, concurrent is more general than interleaved and uh, parallel. So a concurrent program may have a number of processes of threat, each of which runs on a CPU or a CPU core they all execute at the same time. A parallel program needs multiple CPU or multiple cores, but a concurrent program may only need one to run because this concurrent program simply runs in an interleaved way. So why? we may write a concurrent program with multiple processes or threads. Your first exercise would be writing a program with multiple processes. Now, 
you compile your program and run on a system. If the system have enough number of CPUs, all processes or thread can run in parallel. Otherwise, the operating system assign each process or all thread some CPU time in turn so that they can finish their job bit by bit. And this explains the difference between uh, commonly seeing parallel computing and the uh, concurrent computing, which we'll, we'll learn in this semester. Now, concurrent is not a very new thing. This world is actually an inherently very concurrent. You watch Super Bowl. Probably you have pizza, you have hot dogs and popcorns and even drink there. So you are executing four processes, drinking, eating popcorn, eating a uh, hot dog, and uh, eating pizza. And the fifth one would be watching TV. So you do it in a concurrent way. You won't continue, continually eating, and you probably won't watch the TV uh, all the time. So you watch TV for some time and switch back for a, a, a bite of pizza and so on. So this is concurrent. Now we are all programmers. While we are programming, we may have a, a headset or earphone in order to listen to music or radio broadcasting. At the same time, we may write email and talk to uh, your buddies and so on. For an example, you may open several windows. One, the browser, in order to search on Amazon or eBay in, or in order to find something, to buy something. At the same time, you may also open a, your email account to see what has happened. And you also open a word processor in order to type a report or doing exercise. And then while you are typing your paper, your cell phone rings or you get a notification call. Then you stop typing and switch to address that notification. After doing that, after typing, typing a, a few sentences, then a email comes. You reply to that email. So you are running multiple tasks, each of which is not run completely parallel. They are running in an interleaved way. So you are doing concurrency. Now it's the beginning of your semester whether you are important or not. Frequently I saw people driving, and uh, texting at the same time. So of course, you cannot do driving and texting in parallel unless you are a superman. So frequently what I saw was uh, a guy put their uh, cell phone on top of the steering wheel and type for a few words and uh, uh, watch road condition, traffic condition, and it's okay, then turn back to uh, type a few words and, and move their heads up and look around and then uh, type a few words. And this is a concurrent operation, isn't it? Texting and the driving in an interleaved way, although this is very, very risky. You can find many concurrent stuff in a computer system, please think about it. Now, before we move on to some real thing, I ask you this question. I want you to pause uh, the video for a while in order to think about my question. What is my question? 
will your program execution be suspended when it is doing input or output? Here are two separate examples. On the left, this program, after an assignment, prints out the value of x, and then uh, it one to x. On the right, a separate program, after an assignment, read the value into variable x. The value to be read in is 100 and at one to x. Now, the question goes as follows. While this program is doing the printing stuff, can this program immediately execute this assignment? By the same reason, while this program is executing this read, can it execute x equals x plus one immediately? Now, if we use our uh, previous defined word concurrent, can print x and uh, this assignment be executed concurrently? Or can this read and this assignment be executed concurrently? So pause this video and think about it. I wish you answer either yes or no with a reason, a convincing reason, rather than a very vague claim. This course, a portion of this course would require rigorous reasoning, which many of you are not very good. So let's practice bit by bit. So please pause, and when you get your answer, get back, uh, restart or resume playing this video. Now, when you when you are back, your answer is either a yes or a no. Or some may want to say, I don't know, because I cannot ask you a question directly you should not answer, I don't know. You should answer either yes or no, after some thinking. Now, if you answer yes, congratulations, you get it. Or if you answer no, sorry, your answer is incorrect. We will discuss why. Now your answer, yes, is probably based on your sequential thinking. Uh, read this and after getting X, then I do this or uh, assign it, uh, read this. And before we can finish read, we cannot do this because we need the value X to be 100. Good reason. Then why? We cannot execute print X and uh, this assignment at the same time. Think about this. When you want to print something, the value of X, which is a binary, will be copied to a output device, and uh, probably converted to a printable ASCII code, and then print it out. This is usually a very lengthy process and very slow. Now, adding one to X is fairly easy. It could be performed probably several million times a second, but in doing actual printing something out to a printer, assuming that you print out to a printer, in a, in a second, you probably would not be able to print many values. So if we allow print X and this assignment to be executed concurrently, something bad could happen. Say, this program orders the output device that get a value of X printed out. And right after this order, your program start this assignment. As I mentioned to you, the assignment execution can be extremely fast, much, much faster than the printing. 
it is very likely that after adding one to x, this print x is just started probably even before copying the value of x. So in that case, when this print x copies the value of x to an output device, the value of this x may be this one because this one runs much faster than, than uh, this statement. So should this happen, the value copied to the output device is x plus one, that's 11. So the printout would be 11 rather than 10. Now look at the right-hand side case. Reading is even slower than printing. How many key presses you are able to type per second? Not many. So in this read, in this read, the input device must read something from somewhere, keyboard, a disk, uh, a paper tape or whatever. So reading a value, this value has to be in ASCII code rather than binary. Then convert that ASCII key code to three digit one, zero, zero to binary. It takes time too. So if you allow read X and this assignment to be executed, at the same time, then this statement will finish much faster than this statement. So should this happen before the read completes, the value of X has been changed to 11. And then this read finishes its reading by converting 100 and put into X the result of X is 100 rather than 101. So please stop here, review what I said before I continue. So what I said actually illustrates a very, very important concept, which could happen very frequently in your program. That is, we have two statements, we have a, we have two statements, print X and assignment. They share that variable X. You may want to say, of course, because they use the same variable X. So X is shared by that print X and the, the assignment statement below. That's right. That is from your sequential programming mindset. But we are doing concurrent here. If you allow print X and this assignment to run concurrently, the sharing is no more a sequential share. A sequential share means I do this and then do this. Now, variable X is being shared concurrently by print X and the, the statement assignment below. By the same reason, this variable X is shared concurrently by this statement and the, this statement. The magic word here is concurrent because those two statements are executed in a concurrent way. If your program execution is not suspended while it is doing input or output. So this concurrent sharing usually gives us headaches in writing program. It's very difficult to find unless you are very careful. So, how do we overcome this concur the 
the problem introduced by concurrent sharing. Let's get back to our sequential execution. We do this followed by this, we do this followed by this. So we do this followed by this. Actually cut, actually cuts the uh, concurrent sharing. In concurrent computing, this concept is referred to as mutual exclusion. Simply put, mutual exclusion means if we share something concurrently, say variable X, while I am using it, you cannot. Or while you are using it, I cannot. So X is a variable shared concurrently. If we enforce mutual exclusion, then while this one is using it, this one cannot. And for the same reason, because X is concurrent shared, if your program does not uh, suspend as is not suspended while it's doing input output. So this input output and the next statement would be uh, would be uh, would have the potential to have concurrent sharing. As a result, we have to be very careful. We enforce mutual exclusion because I reach here first, therefore while I am using it, you cannot. So this simple example illustrates two important concepts in concurrent computing. One, concurrent sharing. Two, mutual exclusion. We will introduce these two concepts in more detail in later lectures. But let's return to our original purpose. The question asks you, will your program's execution be suspended when it is doing input or output? The answer is definitely yes. Because of the two examples discussed below. Now, after knowing this, when a program does input output, its execution has to be suspended until the input output operation finishes. This concept actually appeared in operating system design. In the good old days, late 40s and early 50s, computers were very large and most of them can only run one program. So when that program starts doing input or output, its execution will be suspended. In the late 40s and early 50s, input output devices are very, very slow. Today, most of you print out things by laser printer or inkjet printer. Laser printer is very fast. The fastest laser printer I have yet ever used was an IBM uh, large laser printer built for mainframes. It could print 3000 pages per minute. The first laser uh, consumer type laser printer released by Apple computer was in 1985. Approximately about the same time, slow inkjet printer appeared. Before that, we used dot matrix printer, which is good enough, but the printing is not very good looking. Now, before that, most printer saw typewriter like. You just hook up a typewriter that could recognize ASCII code as if it's being typed by a typist. So it's very, very slow for output. For input, keyboard hasn't changed. But today's keyboard may be more friendly 
to you than the keyboard uh, decades ago. But in the old days, the keyboard is just like a teletype, very old typewriter. Furthermore, the very famous IBM typewriter, Selectric typewriter, only appeared in the 60s. So in the early 50s and late 40s, it's just a plain old typewriter, mechanical typewriter. It's very slow. So other type, uh, other input device may be paper tape or punched card. In, in this scenario, you know, the input output devices are very slow. Although CPUs were not so fast, probably your, note, your laptop is much faster than uh, a large mainframe in late 40s and early 50s. So imagine this, a program does its input output, CPU, your program execution must be suspended. CPU becomes idle. Many people consider this a waste of money. In that era, CPUs are very, very expensive. Hundred thousands of millions. So let's say one billion a copy. So if your program consistently spend say 60% uh, of just execution time to do input output, then it only use 40% of the CPU time. And 60% of the CPU time is in idle state. So you pay $1 million for that CPU, only $400,000 are being used and the the remaining $600,000 are a waste, right? So we have to find some way to overcome this issue. The earliest paper I could find was a paper mm -hmm. written by Rochester published in 1955, which is titled The Computer and Its Peripheral Equipment. In this paper, Rochester addressed our concern. Simply put, if a program must be suspended while it is doing input output, and the CPU of course would be in the idle state, why don't we run a second program? Today is a common knowledge, but to Get to that point, it's not so easy. But anyway, let's say we have two programs, program one and the program two. When program one does input output, program one cannot use the CPU and the CPU becomes idle. Then we run program two. In other words, program two simply uh, eats up the idle CPU cycle. When program two does input output, CPU becomes idle and we run program one. So in this case, isn't it a concurrent running of program one and program two? Program run for a while, use the CPU and program two use, uses the CPU and do it in an interleaved way. So this is the beginning of the concurrency. Now, you may want to think, um, if we could run two programs, why don't we run three programs? Because it, it is possible that program one and program two may do their input output at the same time, then CPU will be idle. Then I run pro program three, that's good, good idea, but the CPU computation power is always limited. So running more program does not mean you, your system would be more efficient. Let's just look at two 
uh, look at the two program case. If program one and program two get a fair share of the CPU, each of which consume 50% of the CPU time. So in this case, running program one and program two concurrently, CPU usage would be 100%. Now you put program three in. Assuming that the behavior of program three is very similar then program one, program two, program three, each would consume only 30% of the CPU time in a period. So each program would run slower instead of 50% of CPU time in a short period. Program one, program, program one CPU share would be reduced to 30%. So it's only 60% of the original running speed. So that tells you something. We cannot run unlimited number of programs in a system. Given the system limited resource, number of CPU or number of cores. This was a intensive research in soft, software engineering and the operating system in in the early 80s, the number of programs that can run concurrently in a system is referred to as the degree of multi-programming. This degree is of course a variable because different program may have a different behavior. So the mix of this program is kind of a dynamic, but all rooms are available to choose the best mix of programs to run concurrently so that we always maintain CPU performance 100% at the optimal level. This idea also applies to our concurrent programming. Because our program will be split into many pieces that run concurrently, you cannot split your program to an unlimited, unlimited number of pieces because we just do not have the CPU power to execute all of these uh, concurrent running pieces at the same time or in an efficient way. So always remember this. We will talk more about this uh, later on. In the 1960s, as we mentioned, operating system could run multiple program at the same time, of course, in a concurrent way. So the most successful operating system in that era was the IBM system 360s. It could run 16 programs, even on a smallest one, could run 16 programs uh, concurrently. This is referred to as multi-programming. Now, the concept could trickle down. A system consider a unit, it could run multiple programs. Now, in each program, if we, we apply the same technology for designing the operating system to programming languages, then programmer or language designer may have the following thinking. We could allow a user program to cut or to split its program into multiple pieces so that they will run concurrently. Uh, each of these multiple pieces may be referred to as a task a, or a threat or a process. But today, virtually we use the word threats. In other words, your program, given that technology, your program can be split into multiple threats or multiple tasks. They run concurrently. So in this way, our program is no more sequential.
our single program could be made concurrent. This is what you're going to learn in this semester. So if we can do that, our an operating system could run multiple programs. And each program can have multiple processes or multiple threads. Therefore, concurrent programming is born. You may want to say, I have never seen a language that supports concurrency. Well, there are some language currently available, but they are not so well known. The most well known ones are Java and C++. But this start very early in the early 1960s. A number of higher level programming language started to support concurrency. The most well-known two are IBM's PL1. PL1 means programming language one. IBM designed PL1 in order to absorb all of those good things from Fortran and COBOL and uh, Lisp into a single language so that you could forget about Fortran, forget about COBOL and forget about Lisp. IBM's goal was so ambitious. PR1 was such a complex and large language. I would like to mention one very interesting feature. In the 60s, computer memory is very small, just a few megabyte, let alone gigabyte. So one megabyte, two megabyte or something. So users program cannot be very large. You have to cut your program into a segment so that when that segment is needed, it will be loaded into memory, overriding a several unneeded segments. This technology is referred to as overlay. So program cannot be very large. In PR1 was the first, probably the first major language that support pointers and also support dynamic memory allocation. So in PR1, you could do the following. You allocate a piece of memory, say uh, 4K. And then every newly allocated uh, data structure would be in that area. When that area is full, you could ask the PR1 compiler to write that piece of memory out to somewhere, say to a disk. And then erase the, con erase the content and reuse that piece of memory. Then when the old segment is needed, you could ask the compiler to reload that segment back to somewhere. All of the data you save there can be reused. Even today, no programming language can do that. Of course, no programming language would want to do that because the memory is so cheap today. So one of the most interesting feature in PL1 is the tasking capability. We write a PL1 program, just like you write a C program. You write functions, procedure, and so on. In C or in other programming language, you call a procedure. Entering that procedure, execution entering that procedure and, and would do something. But in PR1, you could call a procedure as a task or a threat. So suppose in my program, I have three functions, A, B, and C. Traditionally, you call A 
call B, call C would be executed in the following way. You call A, execution enters A. When execution returns from A, you call B, and then B returns to the main program, then the main, pro the main program calls C. When C returns, the main program continues. This is a typical way of calling functions in a, a sequential programming language. But in PL1, you could call a function like this, call A as a task. So when you call A as a task, then you create a thread. That thread would run your function A. So if we execute the following in the main program, call A as a task, call B as a task, call C as a task, then when you call A as a task, a thread A is created and uh, your main program immediately execute call B as a task. A task would be created. And right after this, while A and B are running as tasks, main program call C as a task. So after creating with these three tasks, A, B, and C, main program continue. In this way, the main program creates four tasks, including the cell, your program has four tasks running concurrently. I learned multi-tasking programming with PL1, but not all PL1 compilers support tasking. Only the PL1 F compiler supports tasking. But that F compiler was a experimental one, never released to the general public. So I learned uh, concurrent computing, first of all, by the use of similar capability offered in PL1 in under the IBM operating system. I am not going to talk about this, just remind you that happened in the 60s. I learned this in, uh, don't remember exactly when, probably late 70s or early 80s. And uh, there is another language not so commonly used, algo. Algo means algorithmic language. The last L is the L in language. This language was defined by European uh, countries. First of all, that was ALGO 58. Then the most commonly used was ALGO 60. PR1 appeared in mid 60s. And then ALGO 68, here 68 is the year that language was formalized and approved. So ALGO 68 also supported uh, tasking. In the 70s, the most commonly used language was Pascal in education or academia. That language was simple and compact, easy to learn, easy to use, but that was an educational language. Therefore, in the 80s, the designer of Pascal put all what he learned into a new language called Modular. Then in Modular 2, followed by Modular 3, these two languages, Modular 2, started supporting tasking. After that, in the 80s, the largest language ever developed ever. I used to say PR1, ADA, and C++ are three dinosaur type language, so complex. And some uh, experimental programming language, concurrent Euclid, Turing plus and so on. These languages all support concurrency. 
你有没有 want to say C K? You forgot Java? No, I did not, because Java is a late comer. It was developed and become available in very late eighties and early nineties. The new standard C plus plus also supports concurrency. That makes C plus plus even more complex to learn. So, in addition to these programming languages, uh, systems, operating systems in particular, su start support system calls, uh, and the libraries allowing you to create uh, multiple processes running together. For an example, uh, Unix in the early eighties. Uh, standardized the way of creating processes. You could call the function fork to create child process, which will be discussed in uh, part two. And uh, in late eighties, whole lot of library appeared that support concurrency. The most well-known one is the pthread library. So concurrent programming was booming in the nineties. Some university in late nineties and early 2000 started offer courses like Java, concurrent programming in Java, something like that, or concurrent programming in XYZ, a programming language. Some operating system courses start to emphasize concurrency. And Michigan Tech started offering concurrency components in, a, uh, in an operating system course in late 90s. Throughout the 20s and 2010, concurrency has been there for more than two decades. In 2011, the concurrent components was cut out of the operating system course becoming this course. And many students feel that this is a very tough course. Yes, it is. Now, after learning some of those uh, good things, you may be very excited because you could cut your program into pieces and running concurrently, but the picture is not so rosy because of several things. One, cutting your program into so many pieces may not be so efficient because your computer system is not so powerful. As we mentioned, when we talk about uh, running several programs and de the degree of multi-programming. But the most difficult part is given a, given a task to do, converting that task to a uh, sequential program is probably easier. Given that task and splitting your program into multiple processes or thread is easily set than done because there's no universal way telling you how to do that. If your splitting is incorrect, your program may be even inefficient than your sequential version. Fortunately, there are some guidelines, which will be discussed when we talk about threats, multi-threaded programming. Now, under This concurrency requirement that is cutting uh, your, you must cut your program into multiple uh, concurrently running threads. These threads must communicate with itself. If you just cut your process or, uh, or, or processes into threads, they do not communicate, they run independently, then you don't need this. You just write it as a separate program and run it separately. We will talk about how to do that later on, probably a few slides later. So 
when you cut your program into multiple processes or multiple threads, these processes or threads must communicate with each other. Communication is always a problem. For an example, suppose you and I are two threads. We work with each other in order to get a job done. I need something from you in order to continue. So I executed my code. If by the time I reach the point where I need your data and your data is not there, what I get is probably garbage. So my program execution later on would use that garbage to, to generate more garbage. So this means if I reach the communication point, and if your data is already available, then I'm fine. However, if I reach that communication point and your data is not there, you must have some way to inform me that, wait a minute, until I get the data ready for you. And this concept is synchronization. Synchronization is a very difficult concept. Although in this course, we never approach that level of difficulty. We only talk about those easier ones. I'm sure by the time I started talking, I start talking about synchronization, many of you would hate me. And you may wish I may not be the instructor, but no matter who is going to teach this course, the difficulty of synchronization is always the same. So stop whining, stop complaining, pay attention to the course, pay attention to the video and slides and learn. And if you have question, ask. That's the only way for you to overcome this difficulty. Not only synchronization is a headache for you. As I mentioned, splitting a program probably is also difficult. And fortunately, I also mentioned to you, we will provide some guidelines. So this uh, splitting a program probably and doing synchronization probably are two obstacles. To overcome this, requires a new mindset, a design mindset, so that you move away from your sequential thinking, which you are used to for two or three years into a new programming design paradigm. People used to say in computer science, there are several programming paradigm that may be difficult to learn if you are used to sequential programming. One of them is concurrent programming. The other functional programming in which you don't have loop, everything is recursive, everything is recursive, you don't have assignment, you have to learn a whole lot of things that you are not used to. The next one is logic programming. You may learn in a programming language course. It's not it's a statement by statement, proposition by proposition. It's not by execution. It's by logic reasoning. So some computer science educator suggests that if a student has learned and used to sequential programming, converting them to concurrence or parallel programming sometimes is difficult. So I have warned you. You have to learn to overcome this. As I mentioned in the uh, uh, open lecture, I cannot give you success. You have to gain it by yourself. I can only help you, teaching you how to do fishing rather than giving you the fish. So please pay attention to the course, send the email, or if you have uh, some particular problems, 
and get a few bodies and let's do a Zoom meeting. So the next bullet tells you another headache. If you design your program correctly, this headache may not be very consistent. What does that mean? The behavior of concurrent program is dynamic. The co a consequence of this statement is a bug may never occur while you are testing it, but our grader runs your program the first time your bug appears. Or if you're lucky, you know your program has a bug. But no matter how many times the grader runs your program, that bug never occurs. This is the meaning of behave, the behavior of a concurrent program is dynamic. The behavior of your concurrent running program depends on so many factors. First of all, of course, the program logic you implemented. And that is your internal factor, assuming that is all correct. There are so many external factors. For example, many students complain, I run my program 10 times on my laptop. It's correct, but how come the grader runs it and uh, uh, the grader deduct uh, so many points? It's unfair. I said, it is fair because you forgot the behavior, the, dy the dynamic behavior, behavior of a concurrent program. On your laptop, you are the only owner. And there are only a few processes running on your computer. But when you submit your program to CS server, our grader will use that CS server or CS machine to run your program. At the same time, in addition to your program, there are other people's program running. So there are so many programs running at the same time. This external factor changes the be behavior of your program. For an example, because your, your system is lightly loaded, probably just have five or uh, 10 processes running. Then each of these processes would have more ch higher chance to run or the running, the frequency to pick your program to run in an interleaved way may be very high. But in a CS server, there could be hundreds of programs running concurrently. The chance to pick your process to run concurrently may be lower and not change the behavior of your, your program. Furthermore, you may want to say, I could use a debugger to find the bugs because I'm used to use the debugger, say GDB or something or some other things. Don't make this claim so fast. When you use a debugger to run a problematic threat or problematic process, you change the behavior of your concurrent running program. And your bug may never occur. For an example, suppose you run three threads, A, B, and C. You know thread A and thread B are correct. And you know thread C is problematic. So you add a breakpoint and the step execution to thread C. You thought that is okay, but it's not. Because when you insert the breakpoint, your thread C will stop execution at that point for you to examine so many things. At the same time, thread A and thread B are still running. It, so, isn't it that you change the execution behavior? If you go into step-by-step -step execution, 
So threat C would execute much slower than it should be. So this also changed the execution behavior. So relaying on debugger usually would not provide you much help. The only thing that helped you a lot is get a piece of paper and pencil. Design your program first. Go through your, your program logic on paper and make sure everything is fine. Then convert to program statements. I'm sure many of you acquire and habits. You find a machine and open the uh, uh, program assignment, start typing. I can tell you this is the worst learning practice for concurrent programming. You must start fresh from somewhere. So let's get back to the traditional way, get a piece of paper and pencil and lay out your program execution carefully step by step before typing. Okay, this is my advice. You could continue your sequential programming practice, but you are a beginner in concurrent programming. Carrying your bad habit from sequential programming over to concurrent programming would do more harm than good. Now, let's do some uh, simple tests. You can do concurrency very, very easily. Sit down in front of your computer, open multiple windows. In each window, you run an application. Uh, let's do a simple way. You write a simple program, just an infinite loop, just an infinite loop and compile it to say a dot out. Then, you open three terminal window. We use terminal window very frequently. And if you are not used to it, better get used to it. So open three terminal windows and change direction, change direct, uh, directory to the folder where you can find a dot out. Use the CD command line. Argue, uh, command. So now in each window, try to use ls to find whether a dot out is there or not. And some of you may allow this to happen. If you do not allow this to happen, then you have to type dot slash a dot out. Okay. So in this way, dot slash a dot out would run your a dot out program. And then switch to your second window, also do dot slash a dot out. Move to your third window and type dot slash a dot out. You will find out your one binary executable would run on each of the three windows terminal windows, they are running concurrently because the output is generated continually in all three windows. This is, con this is concurrency. The easiest one would be you open a, a Chrome browser and uh, say a word processor, you just click on the icon to open it. Then all of these applications run concurrently. What I said about open three terminal window to run the same program is your programming practice. Now let's look at a very simple example. Do you know this operator? This operator is a Unix command line operator. In C, it is a bitwise end operator. Check your C book for that. So we are doing command line programming rather than C programming. Therefore, 
this ampersand operator is the Unix command line operator. When you type a dot out to run a program, operating system takes this command, your requirement to convert a dot out to become a process. As I mentioned multiple times, don't worry about the meaning of process because we will explain it later in great detail. So this process would read input from std in, which is the keyboard, and print this output to std out, which is the screen. So once you start typing, uh, uh, once you issue the comment that uh, dot slash a dot dot, when a dot dot is running, a dot out has the std in as the keyboard. And uh, you have no way to type anything unless your a dot out start reading. Whatever you type would be useless. Now, this is a diagram. If you run your program, uh, type a dot out, return, your program is running in the foreground because it has the keyboard attached as std in. You could also run your program in background. It means you run that program through a terminal window. If the program is running in the background, that program doesn't have the keyboard attached. That is the std in is not attached to the keyboard. Your std in may come from a file or somewhere else. It's just not a keyboard. So when you when you use keyboard to type in something, what you type will be received by the foreground process rather than by the background process. However, the background process could also could print its output to std out. Its std out is the screen or the window. So you can easily distinguish a foreground process and from a background process. A process running in background, it means the window from which you run the program is detached from that process. And the command line input becomes available to, to whom? To you. So let's take a look at the example. How to run a program in the background? You type the program name followed by the ampersand followed by return. Every program name in front of the ampersand operator will be run as a background process. So if you do not have this ampersand, you type a dot out return. The keyboard is associated with the std in of a dot out. Now, if you have a ampersand here and return, you will notice that the command line prompt appear immediately because std in the keyboard is no more associated with the std in of a dot out. You can type whatever you want or issuing the next command. You may use the ampersand operator as many times as possible. In this case, I run three programs, a dot out, dumb program, smart. Every program precede this ampersand operator will be run as a background process. As a result, a dot out, dumb program are run as two background processes. And smart is run as a foreground process. It's the std in of the smart is connect with your keyboard. Now, if you add this ampersand here following smart, then smart would also be run as a background process. 
command line prompt appears immediately. So these three programs are run concurrently, two in the background, one in the foreground. So you could write an A dot out, compile it, and then open the terminal windows. You type A dot out, M percent, A dot out, M percent, A dot out. So you run three copies of your A dot out concurrently, one in the foreground, two in the background. This is funny, right? Now let's do a pro, uh, program. This program is meaningless actually. Its purpose is just showing to you uh, two program can run concurrently. So this program is proc a dot c proc a dot c. The next program is proc b dot c. You could find this program in the common directory uh, in a uh, tarball. So this program include stdio, include stdlib, which is for uh, the random number of functions. Limit is a constant, a named constant 20. We have four variable i, j, x, y. The first line, you probably have used it. If you haven't, let me explain a little bit. In this program, we use random numbers. Before you use random numbers, you have to plan a seed. SREN function just helps plan a seed, seed S for a random number. The function SREN requires a positive integer as its argument. Here, we use the system called time function. Time with null argument will return a large positive integer, indicate a time of day. So that large integer is used as a seed for generating a sequence of random numbers. Every time if you supply the same seed the generated random number would always be the same. For an example, you could put, uh, say, uh, uh, 1001 there. Every time you could print it out a random number, it's always the same. So to add some randomness, because every time you run your program, time of day will be diff different. So we call time so that every time when I run this program, a different seed would be planned through the SRAM. So we have a nested loops. So the outer loop loops for 20 times. In iter each iteration, we generate a random number by calling rand. Rand would return a positive random number. The size of this random or the maximum value of this random number is machine dependent. You could check this, uh, the system header file limit.h l i m i t s dot h to find the range. So usually this number is at least 32,000 or larger, that is 16 bits. But this number is so large, so we scale down. 10 times by 10. So if the system's random number, uh, maximum random number is 32,000, then the scaled down random number would be 3,200. With this newly scaled down random number, the inner loop simply loop that number of times. In each iteration, we generate a random number to waste some CPU time. Then we print out the value of x here. Now a here, random number is this value. And we go back to generate the next random number, scale it down 10 times, and then use that as the upper limit for the inner loop. 
So we keep doing this 20 times, you see 20 lines. And finally, when this program ends, it prints out A completes. This is what's in the proc A dot C. Now let's take a look at proc B dot C. This is exactly like the proc dot A. The only difference here is we use 30 to scale down the random number. Now, if the generated random number in the, is uh, 3,000, then in proc B, is, X is 300. And uh, uh, in proc A, because it's scaled down by 10, in proc A, it is uh, 1,000. So the value x in proc b is smaller, three times smaller than the value of x in proc b. So that means uh, because the value of x is smaller in b, printing this line in b is faster, right? Because this value is smaller, so this loop would execute faster less number of times. And after doing this, we print out with some indentation B here, this is my random number. After that, we print out this line with some indentation to distinguish between the output lines from A, the output lines from B. Now, let's compile this program to proc A and proc B. Open a terminal window and type proc A ampersand proc B here. It means proc A is run as a background job. And uh, proc B is run as a foreground job. So the output looks like this. If you run your program on a different machine at a different time, the output will be different. Now, as you can see, every line coming from A, high A here, would have some lines, more than one lines usually from B because the value generated in, in B, the X value is smaller. So the inner loop would go faster in B than in A. So here we have a B, we have random number this, and A has a random number this. As you can see, a program A and proc B prints out their output lines in a concurrent way and actually very interleaved a does something, B does something, A does something, B does something, isn't it? So this illustrates the concurrency of running a program in background and programs in foreground. I hope you download the program, compile it and run it this way. And several times to see how the output could change in a random way. Next time you run it, uh, the random number will definitely be different. And uh, it may not be four lines. Sometimes you may, there's no line from B, you have just two considered lines from A. Or sometimes you may have more lines in B and followed by a line from A. That's the external factor that could affect the behavior of concurrently running programs. Then we have two more slides to go. Now, when your program runs, as we mentioned so many times, our operating system converts a, your program to a process. So how many processes of mine are running? The Unix command ts simply report this to me. That's a process status. The PS command does not require any command line argument. Should this happen, the PS command simply reports your own process, that process owned by you under your user ID. You may add some other arguments so that you could see even all process running in the system. But for now, we use a simple one. 
So when you type PS, it's likely you will see something here. As we mentioned, when you type a dot out return, the system would convert your binary executable into a process and the start is its execution. Instead of using your program name as an identification, operating system assigned an ID, a number ID to it. That ID is referred to as process ID, PID here. It's just like uh, the government would not use your name as uh, for identification purposes. Instead, the government agency would use your social security number because I'm sure there are so many Michael Johnsons in the United States. So when you send out a letter to Michael Johnson, you don't know which one should receive it. Instead of using the real name, the government simply assigned you a social security number. In Unix, at the same time, there could be so many a dot out copies running. We should not use a dot out. Instead, we assign a number to it. That number is referred to as a process ID. And uh, that is the first column. The last column, CMD, is the command. Here you see the name. That is, you type a dot out. A dot out will appear here. Its corresponding PID would appear here. Now let's take a look at uh, the middle three. And we leave it the first line to the last one. So here, uh, when I type PROG return, it will be converted to a process with a process ID 28821. When I run a junk concurrently, uh, it has 28822 PID, testing receive a PID 28823. So when you type PS, it lists all process under your ID running concurrently. So from what I said, PROG junk and test are run concurrently. But how come I have a PS here? Just consider PS as your A dot out. PS is a program, a system program stored somewhere. So you type PS return. The operating system simply converts that PS binary executable to become a process, assigning it a PID so that it could run. So when you type PS, it is converted to a process with a PID 28825. So what is this TSCH? This is the shell, your default shell. When you created your uh, CS account, you have a default shell. Right after you ask operating system to open a terminal window, then who is going to control that window? You? No, not at all. When a terminal window is open, the operating system assign your default shell to run as a process, and that process controls that window. For example, I remotely log into my office machine through PuTTY. Then I have a terminal window. So the operating system simply finds my default shell, making it a process to control this party window. And my default process uh, shell is the TC shell. Your shell may be different, C shell, C shell, burn shell, and so on. Whatever it is, your shell window, uh, your shell program will be here. Because your shell is run as a process to control 
the that terminal window. So it also receives a PID, which is 28749. So after typing PS, I have one, two, three, four, five, five concurrently running program. Of these five, uh, PROG, junk, and the testing are my own program. The PS entry is due to I run PS as a process in order to figure out the process status. The TC shell is usually the first one is the default shell that controls this terminal window. So after class, I encourage you to do it several times. Now, finally, there is a top command. Top command is system tool, monitor tool. Different computer may have different one. Uh, for an example, in window, you have task manager and uh, um, Mac OS has a uh, 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 monitor or something. I don't remember the name because it's always on my desktop. So the top command can help us to find who consumed the CPU most. When you type the top command, it shows you all process currently in the system. And here we have some statistics. It shows you there are 158 tasks running concurrently. At that, when I type top, only one is running. And 157 are sleeping. No pro stop, no process are stopped. And there's no zombie, okay? The first line is the PID of the process here. And the second column shows you who are, is the owner of that process. And here, the percentage of CPU used Firefox. And the percentage of memory used and so on. So top does not use much CPU time, only 0.3%. So in this case, immediately you are able to find how many processes are running in the system and who are the CPU hog. That is the process that consume the CPU most. You could sort uh, these rows in different order, but for most of the time, the CPU, were, uh, the CPU usage would be uh, used. So, this ends the first lecture. The next lecture will talk about, again, running multiple processes uh, with some cooperation. So expect to have the next video in a couple of days. See you next time. Goodbye.